Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around. Uh, happy to see you here. Um, my name is Charles, and uh, today's session is called Using Open Daylight. The idea is to focus a little bit more on like a, a bit of an introduction to Open Daylight and um, then show you how to install it and operate it more from the point of view of a user of it as opposed to, say, a developer who would be contributing code to it although maybe it'll help a little bit for that as well. Um, just to get an idea from the audience, um, how many of you are pretty familiar with Open Daylight already? OK, not too many of you. And, and that's, that's a good thing, actually, because this is a pretty, pretty introductory course. Hopefully, there'll be some stuff you find interesting as well. Um, so what we're going to do is start with just a, a very quick discussion of what is, what is SDN, just to kind of level the playing field there. And then we'll talk a bit about open daylight. Uh, then I want to spend some time with network programmability, um, partly because it's a, it's a really important topic. And also, I think uh, one of the things I want to impress on you is that open daylight is a great platform for network programmability and for building network aware applications. Uh, then we'll jump into the stuff that's a little bit more hands-on. I'll show you how to uh, download and install Open Daylight. It, it's fairly easy, so we're, we're going to do it you know, live here. It actually doesn't take very much time. And uh, I'll show you how to bring it up, how to install some features on it. And uh, then we'll go through some use cases where we look at some example networks that you might attach to. Because Open Daylight doesn't do anything on its own. Basically, it needs to have a network underneath it. So uh, we'll look at some different scenarios there and then um, try a relatively straightforward use case that you can do on your own where we use Mininet to, to create a network with some switches and have open daylight uh, control that. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with some additional resources where I'll show you pointers to where you can do everything that, that I showed you here today, uh, as well as some additional information that we have for you within, within DevNet and elsewhere within Cisco. Sound OK? Anyone, uh, something you were really hoping to hear that's not at all listed up here and maybe I can work into the agenda? Well, please do ask questions at any point in time. Um, you know, I, I'd like for it to be interactive. You can wait till the end. But you know, if you have a question, um, you know, just wave your hand a, a lot, and I'll, I'll find you and, and try to answer it as best I can. All right, so what is SDN? So you know, SDN, when it first came out, really the, the core thing with SDN, and when everyone thinks about SDN is, well, it's this separation of the, the control plane from the data plane, right? And with the uh, pure, I would say, definition of SDN, it's not only that, but you're, you use OpenFlow to control what is, or typically white box you know, switches. And um, that was kind of the. Uh, the initial definition, and, and it is a valid definition of SDN, um, but I think, or at least a use case of SDN, but I think you're kind of missing um, a lot of what SDN has to offer. Um, there's actually, I prefer to think of a broader definition of SDN, where it's not just that, but it's we want to really take advantage of all the information that's in the network. It's not just about configuring the network, which is very useful and SDN can do. But it's about being able to have access to all the information that the network has to query it and then make some intelligent decisions on top of it. And that's where network programmability and network aware applications come in, into play. And to me, that programmability, that, that's really the power and the, uh, the excitement that I think SDN brings us. Let's see, I have this clicker. So just to talk about this broader definition of SDN a little bit more, um, you know, I have this picture. And uh, there is this separation of the control plane and the, the forwarding of the data plane. Um, in this case, we are even mentioning OpenFlow being used there. But th there's a lot more. And this was, as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of information that's down here that the network knows about. And if we're able to programmatically access that information, get the real-time information, do some analysis on it at the application level, and then feed that back into our decisions of how we want to configure our network, then I think it's much more powerful. 
See, it's not just like a configure and forget about it. It's let's configure, let's monitor, let's make changes on the fly. And because it's all programmatic, you have you know, instantaneous programmatic access to your entire network. So it's reasonable for you to be able to do this. So thinking of that definition, what is it that we, we need or that we expect from an SDN controller then? I mean, obviously, it needs to be able to you know, configure and control our network, but that's just, that's just the start of things. Really, we want it to be a platform on which we, control, we can deploy SDN applications. So not just configure our switches, but write those higher level applications and plug them into our network. Uh, we really want it to provide a, a good application development environment for us. And so now there's some critical things we need for it to do that. One, we need APIs. If we're going to be able to access this information, we need APIs. We need those APIs to be consistent. We need them to be developer friendly. Um, we'll talk later on about RESTConf and, and how that came into be, but that's one example. Uh, we also want to be able to abstract away from the application developer the details of the network. We don't want them to have to care the, about the network topology. We don't want them to have to care about what underlying protocols we're using on the network, whether we're using, say, for example, OpenFlow, or maybe we're using uh, BGPLS and PSEP, or maybe we're using NetConf to configure everything. Uh, we don't want, at the application level, we don't want to worry about that. We just want to worry about harvesting the information from the network and then making intelligent decisions based on that. Notice that this isn't all about OpenFlow at that point, and you don't really even use OpenFlow in that definition of what we need. So now let's look at Open Daylight. So Open Daylight, it's a controller for SDN, and it's an open source controller. Now, initially, when it came into being, it was targeted at that, that uh, very simple definition of SDN that I mentioned. Let's separate the control and the data plane. And you can see down here in the left-hand corner, uh, there is support for OpenFlow. And that was what initially shipped with Open Daylight. And, and it supports that quite well. But fortunately, it, it does a lot more than that. Basically, in the, in the middle here, it has all the functionality that you would expect of a controller, all your, you know, your network functionality. But as we saw with the requirements of our SDN controller-based uh, platform, APIs are key. And it does have APIs. It has standard APIs as defined through NetConf and RESTConf. And it also has REST -based, uh, other REST-based APIs that it supports. And those are all available to applications so they can get access to everything that's in the network, to configure the network, and to get information back from the network. And then really key to Open Daylight is that it not only supports OpenFlow, but it supports a whole bunch of other uh, network protocols that we can use. This is great if we have existing uh, legacy equipment and we already have a network and we're already using these other protocols. Open Daylight's kind of like the, uh, the Swiss Army Nice of, of controllers. It, it can talk to just about any network element you have. And if I was a vendor and I had a network device that it wasn't able to control yet, because it's an open source project, I could actually create my own plugin to enable Open Daylight to control it. And that's part of why it's been so successful because everyone can contribute to it and make it work with, with their, uh, their network elements or with their applications better. So I mentioned before that Open Daylight is an open source project. And whenever you look at any open source project, it's really important to look at the community behind it because in the long run, the open source project is only going to be good as, as the community that stands behind it. It's really important with an open source project that you don't want all the contribution coming from just, say, one company or one university or any one entity or even just one or two. You really want a broad base of support behind it, of contribution to it. So um, Open Daylight was founded in 2013. And it's run within the Linux Foundation. And the Linux Foundation, in addition to doing Linux, obviously does a whole lot of other open source projects. And they're really great at running open source projects. And they've you know, lended a lot of support and guidance and, and help to the Open Daylight 
community to have it grow. Everything within Open Daylight is licensed under the Eclipse uh, public license. And the, the code base initially that Open Daylight started around, it basically came from when 15 different founding companies came together. Notice it's not just one or two or three, it's actually 15 companies. And they contributed significant amounts of code and perhaps more importantly, uh, software development resources too, to get all this up and running and working together. And the project's grown significantly since then to now there's well over 600 contributors contributing code. This isn't people using it, this is people actually writing code and contributing to Open Daylight. In all, and this is a little bit of a dated uh, piece of information as well, two and a half million lines of code. So th it's a large code base, in large part because of all those plugins that I showed. But at the same time, what I maybe didn't mention is that it's very modular, because if you're not using all those plugins, you don't need to include them in your build or your installation of Open Daylight. And we'll go into that a bit more later on and how you do that. Uh, let's see, Java. So most of the code is Java. Um, there's probably some exemptions, but for, you know, by and large, it's all Java. Um, the very first release that came out came out in early 2014, and it was called Hydrogen. And the second release was called Helium, came out about eight months later. And ever since then, they've kept up this sort of eight-month cadence of coming out with releases. In case you haven't noticed, there, there's a bit of a trend there. The release names are all name, named after elements in the periodic table. So if you want to figure out how old a release is, yeah, you can look that up and, and maybe learn a little bit about or you know, remember back to your chemistry days. The, the current release is called Boron. And I'm trying to remember when the first release of Boron came out. I think it was maybe, maybe it was around October timeframe. And then once the release comes out, if there's a reason that there's um, to do like a, what they call a service release, that's what the SR stands for, perhaps there's a security vulnerability or a major bug or something that gets found, they come out with these um, service releases. So there was an SR1 and then SR2 came out back in December. So that's, if you want to look at what the latest stable release of Open Daylight as of today is, it would be this, Boron SR2. And the next release, which has been in the works for about, I don't know, five months now, is the Carbon release. So if you were to talk to Open Daylight developers, they're almost all focused on Carbon now. Actually, very few people are working on Boron anymore. And the Carbon release is due to come out in May of this year. All right, now I want to talk a little bit more about the software architecture of Open Daylight. Um, as I mentioned, it's Java. that They kind of just chose that, that language um, to use across the board. Uh, Maven is the build system that's used for Java. What's more important, I think, from a user perspective and that you would actually get involved with would be this uh, use of Carafe and uh, the OSGI model that's um, supported underneath that. The idea with Carafe or the benefit that it brings is that it's really good at dynamically loading in bundles or what in open daylights kind of referred to maybe more as features. And you can load uh, these features at runtime and have them registered into the system and have them take effect without taking the server down or without taking the controller down. So as you'll see when we start up open daylight, we'll have a very minimal feature set on it and then we'll start adding features to it so it can do what we want to do. And that's obviously very important because you don't want to be taking your controller down. You want to be able to, over time, enable new features, upgrade features, uh, make changes to it. And uh, the framework that's put in place here works very well for that. Any questions so far? That's kind of the very high level stuff. And now I'm going to shift gears to network programmability. So if you had a, a question about SDN or Open Daylight, um, we'll get into more detailed stuff later on. But before I jump into network programmability, just wanted to check. OK. So the reason why I think we should talk about network programmability is that's actually where a lot of us, a lot of you, are, I assume, are network engineers, right? 
How many are network engineers? Just about everyone, right? Okay. How many of you consider yourself a software developer also? Okay. Well, when we talk about network programmability, it's much, much more important to be a network engineer than it is to be a software developer. The amount of networking knowledge I think that you need to know to do network programmability really well, it's, it's pretty high, a somewhat daunting challenge. Fortunately, you've, you guys have that, that hard part down. The amount of programming skills that you need for network programmability really isn't that tough. If you wanted to go in and start writing code for Open Daylight, that's pretty challenging. If you want to make use of the APIs that Open Daylight provides and write you know, code with that, like some Python coding, or to use those REST-based APIs, or to use RESTConf, NetConf, I'm going to show you that it's not really that hard. And in fact, we have some great classes here in uh, the DevNet zone that help you with that. So you guys are in good shape. A software developer that has no networking background would have a much, much more difficult time stepping into this. So when it comes to the expenses with the network, the other thing to look at is the, the real cost is not so much in the equipment, even though I think uh, we still charge a fair amount of money for Cisco gear and have good margins, but that's not really where the cost is. The cost is more in the time to operate and maintain and configure and do all this stuff with the network. And it's not only uh, a cost in that sense, but also to deploy, you spend a lot more time uh, deploying your network, configuring it, and that type of thing than you do, say, spinning up new servers for compute and other things in, in your environment. So when I talk about network programmability, the, uh, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. But I'm, I'm speaking more from the point of view if you take a look at your virtual or physical infrastructure that you have and some APIs that it provides. Now, you could, from a, an application, make use of those APIs directly and call into, say, say, a switch. And it will have APIs to let you query to get the configuration from it, to make changes from it, to see counters, to do those types of things. You can do all that. You could also have a controller like Open Daylight that sits in the middle and abstracts some of that away from you. So then you could use the the APIs of Open Daylight and have it take care of the lower level details of the, the physical and, and virtual network infrastructure. And fortunately, it's not really like it's an either or. You could be, and a lot of people will be using these things in parallel. For the most part, you'd be going through your controller like Open Daylight, but where it makes sense, you might go directly to the device. Or you could query the device specific information directly through Open Daylight and it'll pass it through. So it's not like it's you know, a one or the other and, and a real difficult trade off. You, you can get the best of both worlds. OK, so when talking about network programmability, it's important to talk about NetConf. So back, I guess it was about 15 years ago now, um, there were some folks within the IETF and the, uh, the Internet Architecture Board. Sorry if that's a little bit hard to read. But basically, they came together to take a look at the state of things with networking and how people were doing network configuration. And they had a lot of equipment vendors there. They had a lot of operators there. Uh, people who operated large networks, and they asked, so how many of you are using SNMP for doing configuration? Yeah, Every, a lot of people are using SNMP, but very few are really using it for doing it for configuration. And if they are, it's probably only for a limited amount of configuration. So what are you using SNMP to configure? to set up VLANs and set up the description of those VLANs you were saying? OK. Well, that's actually more than I hear from most people. Um, by and large, people are using CLI, or were using CLI. And, and I pr it's probably still true today, using CLI for the bulk of their configuration. And that just didn't sound right, because SNMP had been useful for perhaps querying and people using MIBs to take a look at the state of some of their network. but. As a configuration tool, it really hadn't met that challenge. So the IETF thought, OK, we really need to do something better. 
and what they came up with was NetConf. Uh, stands for Network Configuration Protocol. And there's been a couple different revisions. The first one came out in 2006. And what that really did was that took everything that you would do through CLI and allowed you to do it over SSH. So it's really just still focused on configuration, CLI-based configuration, but allowing to finding ways you could do that over SSH in a programmatic fashion. So it was an improvement, but there was really no standard, uh, say, data modeling behind it, no consistency behind it. And with uh, RFC 6241 that came out about five years later, that really started to um, change things. It started to use uh, data models as the basis and just have NetConf be the transport. And uh, really, the definition of what is it you're transporting, what is the configuration information that you're, you're sending down, that's left to Yang. And we'll talk a bit about Yang later on, too. So what did this bring for us? When people were doing all CLI or perhaps doing screen scraping and that type of thing for driving their configuration, there was no well-defined protocols. Every vendor had their own thing. You had to worry about those differences. When we came out with a new version of a uh, router or switch, we might be breaking all the scripting that you had before. Um, it was really painful to be able to automate any of your configuration tasks. But now when you get NetConf in there, and especially with this later version with data models, now you have the concept of transactions, where you can say, do all this configuration, and if anything goes wrong, then roll back and have none of it happen. It's all based on these standard models. So whether you're using uh, gear from Cisco or for someone else, as long as they're supporting these standard models, you don't really care. And there are standard protocols like NetConf, and we'll talk about RESTConf as well that you can use. So this really makes your, 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 your life a lot uh, better, a lot more consistent as you try to automate any of your configuration. So how does NetConf work? NetConf is a, a connection-oriented protocol. Almost everyone uses it over SSH. Uh, you can also use it with, with TLS. The payload is XML, and the payload is the, what is in the XML is defined by uh, Yang data models. So now, init initially, the way you set up a connection is over SSH, you, you connect to the server, and you send a hello message, and it'll send back to you its capabilities. Its capabilities are basically what are the models I support, because the models define the APIs that you have and the, the data that you're able to access through it. So once you've done that, then you can start to basically query in a, a request response type fashion to get information uh, from a server or to change information about it. You do that, and then when you're done with the session, you, you either close or, or kill it to, to close the session. There's some commands that have been defined within NetConf. The uh, all except the top one has to, you see it all has the word config, because the origins of that was all around configuring your device. Get the config does what you would think, right? You're kind of pulling the configuration off the device. Edit the config is when you're going to want to make a change. Copy config, so you basically have a good config. You make a copy of it and start mucking with it. And then when you're happy with it, you're able to commit it in. Uh, using edit config to make that the, the running config, and then delete config to get rid of one of those temporary uh, data stores when you don't need it anymore. And as we talked about at the beginning, though, there's a lot more value to network programmability than just getting static configuration. And that comes from being able to interact with the operational data. And so to deal with operational data, that's where the get command comes in. It not only gives you config, but it gives you all the operational data, all the state information of the box as well, as defined by the model, the Yang model that it's supporting. OK, so I've been mentioning Yang a lot. I should probably talk about it in a bit more detail as to what it is. So it's important to get this distinction between what is a data model and um, what is a network management protocol. So in this case, think of Yang as being your data model. 
And NetConf is an example of a, a network management protocol that you could use. So the data model, that's going to define all the syntax, the semantics, the rules behind your, your data. So like, what does an IPv4 address looks like? What's the structure of that? What are the valid values? That's all captured in the data model. And NetConf, or the, trans, the uh, network management protocol, that's just defining things like uh, you know, the, the, the commands, like the edit config and the get config, and using TLS, and how is the data marshaled when it's on the wire, you know, the fact that you're using XML. So that's the separation between describing the data and its format, syntax, semantics, and then just how do you transport it. So you notice here, Yang, the RFC for Yang is 6020. It's a little bit lower than that NetConf one, that revision of NetConf. I should put a, probably should have used like a timeline or something. But the way it worked in the IETF was first you had NetConf, and then you had Yang, and then you had the new version of NetConf that makes use of Yang. So it's kind of a somewhat logical progression in time. Another important thing to remember with uh, Yang is that um, much like NetConf, Yang is really meant to be a, a modeling language, whereas NetConf is a protocol for network configuration. Yang is a modeling language that had network configuration in mind. So built into it, it has this concept of different data stores. You have configuration data stores, but you also have those operational data stores that we talked about. And when you interact with Yang, you have that concept of transactions and also notifications when something changes. We already kind of talked about this, that uh, Yang provides those constraints, right? Well, let's say the, the format, or when you look at an IPv4 address, just as an example, what's it have to look like? But also, it has a lot of uh, reusable structures that are built into it. Actually, it, it leverages a bit from C++ as a programming language in, in that sense. But it also, um, there's RFCs that have been defined that define the basic Yang types. In addition to what, what's an IPv4 address, what's an IPv6 address, what's an interface, all these things are now standard things that have been defined in Yang, and now you can use those as building blocks when you're defining higher level configurations. And it's all very extensible and modular in that sense. So the structure that's defined within Yang, at the top level, you have containers. And within a container, you can have a bunch of things. You could have another container, you could have lists, and you could also have end elements. An end element is something that's actually going to have a value and typically called a leaf. So I mentioned that a container could have a list. When you look at a list, you could also similarly have a list of lists or a list of leaf elements which is quite common to have a, a list of leaf elements. And, and so eventually what you're going to do is traverse this until you get to your end elements. And those end elements are the things that you can actually query and set. Now showing you how these things work together, if we think about network management, we start with the definition of, of the data. That's what the Yang model is. In the case of NetConf, we'll be encoding it as XML. And then we have the NetConf operations to work on it. And the NetConf operations actually use an RPC mechanism, as we talked about before, request response. And then it's encoded using uh, SSH primarily, or like I mentioned, some people use uh, TLS. Key thing that I want to point out here, though, is this thing down here that's depicted, you can think of this as your network element. This could be a router or a switch. It is, it's on that switch that these uh, data stores actually exist. And it's the, the switch or the router that's acting as the NetConf server. It's not the controller that's acting as a NetConf server in this case. The, the controller, Open Daylight's actually acting as an SDN, I'm um, sorry, as a NetConf client in this case. So it's talking to the server, and the server's saying, here's what my configuration looked like. Here's the Yang models that I support that let you interact with my configuration and my operational state. 
And much like you're used to seeing on a router or a switch, it would have these different data stores, the actual running configuration, the startup configuration, and this candidate uh, configuration, which is something you could be working on and tweaking and eventually make it the running configuration. When you look at uh, Yang models, there's a lot of standardization going on in the industry around Yang models, but not all Yang models have been standardized. Uh, the reason for that is we want to have as much in common as possible, right? So there's kind of large debates, as you can imagine, when you get uh, a bunch of different vendors with different equipment, and they say, OK, hey, what should the we're talking about the configuration of an entire router or switch. What should that look like? There are some differences of opinion, right? Um, and there's differences that are even necessary because there's differences in capabilities. So everything that can be standardized is essentially being standardized. And we're building up more and more building blocks that are standard. So if you, if you think of that as defining maybe about 80% of your configuration, now, if you go with a vendor like Cisco, they have a bunch of uh, equipment. We have a bunch of equipment. And we have some common models that, um, in Yang speak, they augment the standard models. So we support the, the standard model plus some additional stuff that we support across um, all of uh, Cisco networking equipment. That's what we would capture in this common model. And then say we have some very specific functionality that's only supported on, say, the ASR9K, just as a, making up an example. That might have a device-specific model to let you get access to it. So at the end of the day, you still have the access to everything that the device has. A lot of it is uh, per um, standard model. Some of it's per Cisco common model. And some of it's per the uh, device-specific model. And the way, Yang, um, yeah, the way Yang works, you're able to layer these things by extending a model or augmenting it as, as, as you, that's the term that's used in Yang. So what does a Yang model look like? This is just a small snippet. Uh, they can get pretty large. This is a pretty well-defined one because you see they have a really nice long description. But because of that, it means I can't put too much on the screen. But if you remember when we looked at the format or structure of a Yang model, you have the container. Within the container, you have a list, one or more lists, perhaps. And then you have leaf elements within the list. So that's just giving you an example of what it would look like if you were to use VI or your favorite editor to, um, to take a look at one. The good thing is it is, it is human readable. It was meant to be human readable. To get Yang models, fortunately, it's very easy. Almost all the Yang models that people are using are on GitHub. By and large, if you go to GitHub slash Yang models slash Yang, you'll find just about everything there. Um, you'll find models that the IETF's working on, that Open Config Project's working on. You'll also find the Cisco-specific uh, Yang models under like a vendor portion. And so this is a great resource. And don't worry about getting the um, URLs down or anything. It's, uh, the slides are available, and you, you, can, you can grab them. Within DevNet, we do have some Yang models. I would say these are probably a little bit more experimental, or, or you know, they're there for a certain purpose. Uh, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't migrate into um, the other uh, repository when, when the time is good for that. Because it's, it's much easier to find if they're all in the same GitHub repository. I mentioned and we saw that Yang models are human readable, but they can also get to be quite large. So it's nice if you have some tools to help deal with, with them. These are a few tools that are very handy. Uh, PYang, have any of you used or heard of PYang? OK, yeah, and you're also familiar with Open Daylight. <laughs> so uh, PYang, it, it's, it started out as being a Yang validator. So I have a, a, a large Yang model. How can I make sure that it's well-defined? And, and that's what PYang can do. But it also has some other cool things to help you. Um, uh, it's a command line tool to help you look at, at the Yang model. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. 
Yang Explorer is a graphical tool, a browser-based tool that basically lets you look at your Yang models as well and then drill down into them. This is just kind of a screenshot depicting um, what's happening. And notice this is that same IETF interfaces uh, file that I looked at before that we showed uh, using VI. And then Open Daylight has Yang tools. And this is a really cool feature of Open Daylight that with these tools, what Open Daylight's able to do is read in a, a Yang model, like when a network device says, hey, here's my Yang model, Open Daylight can pull it in and generate code that supports that API, right? So basically, all the request response mechanisms that need to be in place, that all gets generated. And if there's already existing code within Open Daylight to deal with it, um, like when someone does make a request and to um, say some higher level logic that's needed in open daylight, it'll all just automatically work. If it doesn't, you might still need to write some code in the controller, but all the interface level, all the API handling stuff all gets generated on the fly and gets linked in. Okay, and here's an example of um, using Pyang. You can use Pyang with dash F tree, and what that's going to do is, in addition to validate it, uh, give me a tree-like structure of what my Yang model looks like. And so you can see here it's, it's putting out um, the list, which is it's a list of interfaces and all the interfaces that we have. And the one that's read-write, that's because it's got configuration data that you can actually change. And the one that's read-only, that's because it's, uh, it's the operational state, and it's just there for you to query, but you can't change it. Another cool example of Pyang, you can actually output it, use this JS tree option, and then what it's going to do is put out a, um, uh, an HTML page that you can navigate to. And just like we saw with the previous tool, you can click on these things and it'll expand and you can traverse your, your Yang model that way. So it really makes it a lot easier to work with Yang models. The fact you can get them all off GitHub and then you can use these tools to, uh, to traverse them and understand them a bit better. And now let me quickly talk about RESTConf. So we already had NetConf, and you might ask, why do we need another protocol? The idea with RESTConf is, um, let me think if I have a better picture. Well, I, when I think of NetConf, it's really good for like device level communication. So like from the controller to talk to the underlying devices, more like automated type configuration information. It, it, it's a great interface for that. But for application developers, uh, especially like web application developers, they are really much more used to using REST-based APIs. And so NetConf looks a little funny to them. Um, they also, to them, XML is very old school. They, do, they, don't, they, they hate that. Uh, they like JSON. So RESTConf was really developed as, I'd say, a, a simplified version or like a, does you, gives you a subset of what you get with NetConf, but basically provided a, a REST-like interface through which you can do a lot of the same things you could do with RESTConf. So, and it uses JSON instead of HTML, uh, sorry, instead of XML, and it uses HTTP for transport instead of SSH. So if you're a web app developer, it's going to be much more intuitive to you to use RESTConf. And with RESTConf, basically what ends up happening is you define a URL that is used to access the data. And the structure of that URL is what I'm showing here. And it's basically you start with the host, which would be the name of your network element or your open daylight controller. And then top is going to be like API or RESTConf. That's just like the head of your API. And then you would go into it and it say it would be like interfaces and interface and then what's the name of the interface. You basically construct this if you're familiar with REST, you construct this URL in order to access uh, the information that you're looking for. And this is just a, to the, a picture of what that would look like. You can see this would be like the IP address and port on which my controller is using. This is top, is API. I'm, I'm accessing the running data store, and I want to get the interfaces. And if I was to do a GET request with that, I'd get back all the interfaces on the device. And as you might expect, since it's a REST-based API, these are all the normal REST operations that you would expect. And so basically, RESTConf commands have been mapped to these REST-based uh, APIs. 
Okay. Now, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I want to save some time for the demo stuff. And the idea here being that you can use RESTConf, you can use NetConf, you may hear some people using gRPC, you can use Open Daylight to, to generate your APIs. Regardless of what you're using and what the underlying transport is, the, thing, the key thing is that they all fall back to and support and make use of these Yang models. So you can see why the Yang models are so critical, because they drive they, the format of the data that really is at the heart of all these is the Yang model. And then these are just different ways to encapsulate and transport them. I'm going to skip through that and show you here. This might be good to walk through. So the idea is when, let's say I want Open Daylight to control this network. So I'd start out with, with this set. Open Daylight doesn't know anything about the underlying network, except that, say, I tell it the IP address and the, um, the credentials it's going to need to SSH into it. And then what it would do is, through NetConf, it would go out, query the device, it would pull in, uh, it, it would add it to its inventory, and then it would have, know all the Yang models that that uh, device supports, and it would add those into its cache. And then it would go talk to the next element, which happens to support the same Yang models. It would also add it into its inventory, but now there's nothing for it to add into its cache, so it goes to the next network element, adds it into an its, its inventory. And now w, OpenWRT has a different set of Yang models, or at least some of them are different. So it adds those into its cache too. So now Open Daylight has an understanding of Yang models that are needed to interact with these devices, which means it's also generated code to uh, deal with the APIs that are involved there to talk with them all using NetConf. OK. Got about 10 minutes, and I'm going to jump into the installation aspects now. So yeah, we're going to get a little bit more hands-on now. And um, the idea being that I mentioned before, the current release is Boron SR2. So if you wanted to start using Open Daylight to control a network today, you would go here. You would download that. It'd take a couple minutes. And then to start up Open Daylight's as easy as this. You just type. Um, you just unzip that, type bin carafe, and you should be up and running. And when you first start running Open Daylight, it's going to have very few features uh, installed. Actually, I'm going to switch from, it's probably easier just to show you. So I'm going to try this. If this doesn't work, I'll use the slides instead. But hopefully it does work, and then this will be much more informative, I think. Is that big enough? Can you guys see? So what I did here was I pulled down this zip file for Boron release SR2. I'm just going to unzip it. Whoops, I need to give it the name, sorry. Uh, doesn't take too long to unzip. All right, and now I can do bin slash carafe. Whoops. Oh, sorry. I need to go into the directory of it. And now here I do bin slash carafe. And these commands are in the, uh, the slides without the typos. So they should be pretty easy to follow. And that's how quick it is to start up Open Daylight. So now Open Daylight's running. And I can see what features are running on it by doing a feature list dash i. And I actually have very few features running. That's why it started up so fast. I can also do a query to see all the features that exist. And if I do this, you can see I got a much longer list. I actually scrolled way off my screen. So those are all the features that exist. So I have Open Daylight up and running. Now, what I want to do is attach it to a network. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the simplest network that I can attach to. And that would be this one. So how many of you have heard of Mininet? OK, Mininet's an easy way to spin up a very small network. 
Um, and I'm going to use that because I'm going to run it right here on my laptop. And there's a couple other things. Take a look at the slides because I didn't leave myself enough time to cover this. But these are just other example networks that you can connect to um, using VPP or using, because I mentioned Open Daylight can be used with a lot of different uh, network elements. This is an example using BGPLS and PSEP. But for the point of getting something you can work with right away, I'm going to stick to this simple mini net example. So what I'm going to do, you already saw me install Open Daylight. I'm also going to go and install Mininet, which is listed at the top step there. I'm going to start up Mininet, and within Mininet, I'm going to bring up a network of three switches. And then I'm going to have Open Daylight connect to that. So let's go ahead and do that. I get out of slide mode. Oh, the other really important thing that I didn't mention is, and it's, it's mentioned in this slide, is I need to enable some features on Open Daylight in order for it to be able to do all this. And here's the list of features that I need to enable. This feature, whoops. Feature install is how I do it, and I need to enable these features. So I'm going to get that going on my Open Daylight. Let's go back to Open Daylight here. And I'm going to do a feature install. RestConf, so that's one feature I need because I want to be able to interact with it using RestConf. And I'll show you once it's up and running how we do that. But then I also need the L2 switch. And this is something, if there were any errors, it would tell me as I'm entering these. Otherwise, it's just going ahead and installing them. The L2 switch is what I'm going to need. When I start up Mininet, it's going to uh, spin up three different nodes, which are running open flow, as OpenFlow nodes. And I'm going to use OVSDB um, to interact with them. So uh, that's, what, that's why I need this layer to switch functionality. And then I also want to be able to use the graphical uh, user interface that comes with Open Daylight, and that's called Deluxe. And so I'm going to go ahead and install that as well. And just to give you an idea of what Deluxe looks like while I'm waiting for that to install, When you first install Open Daylight, you will get a screen that looks like um, that looks like this. This is Deluxe. This is the uh, the UI that ships with Open Daylight, and we'll go ahead and take a quick look at that as well. So let's see. Did my L2 my L2 switch is still installing? You can see it was very fast to start up Open Daylight at the beginning, but it does take a little bit of time to install features. But once they're installed, then they run really fast. So OK. So those are all the features I should need. Now I should have an Open Daylight instance up and running that I can go to. It's running on my local host. So I'll browse to it, and I can log in. And the credentials are just admin, admin. And I can see my whole network. And that is my whole network, because I have not started a network yet. So to start a network, I'm going to use Mininet. So let me start Mininet. OK. I log into Mininet. The credentials for that are Mininet, Mininet. And I have a script in here that will start a three-node network. So I just ran that. So now I have a three-node network up and running. If I look at Open Daylight and do a reload, now you can see it, it sees those switches. So those switches exist. I also have some hosts, but I don't, haven't run any traffic yet. So I'm going to do a ping all. Sorry, this is, 
probably real small and hard to read, but let me make that just a little bit bigger. So if I do a ping all, okay, so I was able to ping from hosts to all my switches and from one host to another. So now I've generated some traffic on open daylight or in the network. And because I generated some traffic, if I come back here, I should be able to reload and sure enough. So now I, now I can see my host too. All right, so now that's kind of cool. I can also go and look at the, my nodes, and I can see all the connections. So for example, these are my three switches, open flow one, two, and three. If I look at connectors, I can see how they're each connected. So switch two is connected to three, to itself, to one. OK, that's all great too, but this is about network programmability. So let me go to the Yang UI. So there's a reason why I loaded this. If I go to the Yang UI, this shows me all of the Yang models that have been loaded into Open Daylight. And you can see there's quite a few. And if you remember, what Open Daylight does, it generates code for all these Yang models. So now I should be able to go and use these Yang models. For example, we just loaded in a switch, like three different switches that we know about. So if I go to uh, the inventory, where is that? The inventory model, and I say, show me all the nodes that are configured within Open Daylight. I can do a get, and I get an error. Why do I get an error? Exactly. It's the config. And as we saw at the beginning, there was no network. I have no configuration. I'm picking this all up. This is all operational data. If I go to operation and click on node, and instead, and this command down here, this is, this is the uh, restconf command that you would be using if you were writing, say, Python or something else. Now it works. Now I can go and I can look at what it returns. And you can see it returns me. Open flow one, two, three, and some details about it. Not only that, but if I want to drill a little bit deeper, I could, and I could request a specific node, for example. Give me only open flow, because the ID for that is you know, open flow one, two, three. Give me only open flow two, and do a send. And now I can get that. And now I'm getting just the node with ID open flow two. So this is just to show you how easy it is with Open Daylight, both to find out what APIs are supported and then to make use of those APIs. I'm doing it using the GUI, but I could be including it in some code that I wrote very easily as well. OK, so now let me get out of this, and we will wrap up. Okay, so in terms of additional resources, if you go into DevNet, we have something called our Open Source Dev Center. And that's where you'll find information, not just about Open Daylight, but about all the open source projects where Cisco's uh, contributing significantly and using it in our products. So Open Daylight, OpenStack, other things like that, all the information's there. There's a whole microsite, is, and that's what we call them, dedicated to open daylight where you can see what's going on within Cisco. I mentioned it's a great platform for writing network aware applications. This is just a sampling of some network aware applications that we've written, applications that all run on top of and with open daylight. The source code's all available. You can download them, start playing with them. That'll give you a really good idea of how to write your own applications. And maybe you, you'll even find exactly what they do useful for your needs already. Uh, we have a sandbox. This is where you can run Open Daylight with a more interesting network. Instead of using Mininet, you can actually spin it up and have it work with a bunch of uh, Cisco gear that we have in that sandbox. This is where you can go to get some help uh, if you have problems with using Open Daylight. Uh, the Spark Room, I'll be watching that. If you have any questions you think of in the next few days, join that Spark Room, send them to me. I'll answer them as best I can. 
please do fill out your evaluation. That's very, very useful to me. Even if you hated what you saw today, that's good for me to know, and I'll, I'll try to fix it for next time. And if you loved it, I'm, I'm happy to hear that too. And then to continue your education here, you can go and check out this link. I know it's pretty late in Cisco Live, but that's all the open source related sessions we have. You can become a member of DevNet and just the link for the Open Source Dev Center. So every, again, everything I did here, you should be able to get access to. And that's it. I have one minute for questions. <laughs> yeah. North, oh, what's that? Yeah, REST Conf. Yeah, there's, there's an API for the northbound interface. Um, that is, well, you have to authenticate. Like, for example, if you were using RESTConf, you have to authenticate through RESTConf. If you were using, uh, I'm trying to get back to the picture I have near the beginning that shows those interfaces. Because it, it was pretty early on. Now, oh, here. So, yeah, you would have to authenticate. If it's a REST based interface, it's going to have some authentication mechanism. If it's RESTConf, I think it's using HTTP basic authentication. You would hopefully encrypt it over HTTPS so that it's useful. <laughs> oh, to only give them access to part of the data that's there? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. There may be some way to restrict that in Yang. Um, I'm not sure. That's actually a really good question. So you want them to have access to some of the information, but not to all of it. Yeah, I don't know. Let me, uh, let, let me look into that. <laughs> I don't know that one off the top of my head. Sorry about that. If you send a question in the Spark room, I'll make sure to find an answer for you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I got to make room for the next speaker.